You are listening to Leading the Factory Forward with your host, Lynn Friest. We share interviews with manufacturing experts and strategies for embracing the digital future, recruiting a new workforce, finding new business. Lynn is an advanced manufacturing strategist and leadership consultant who is on a mission to show manufacturing leaders how to improve their current operations while preparing for a digital future. And here's your host, Lynn Friest. Hello, and welcome back to Leading the Factory Forward. This episode will be about creating mini habits. And this is part of a four-part series that's focused on you, the leader, and how to build some key skills and improve your effectiveness. In the last episode, we talked about finding the space to lead and become a good leader. This one will be about creating habits that will be useful to you as a leader. Our next episode will be determining how to do focused or deep work. And the final episode or the final part of this will be on how to be effective on the road from a book called The Elite Road Warrior. So for habits, what's the problem? There's a quote from Will Durant, a noted philosopher. He says, we are what we repeatedly do. Excellence is therefore not an act, but a habit. And he's, you know, talking about the same ideas others have had is, again, Charles Dewey would say that habits are part of our everyday life, and they actually comprise 40 to 45% of our actions every day. And other people will often say, don't just create goals. You actually have to create new habits. And that's often the purpose of what I do when I'm trying to help leaders through coaching. So today we're going to talk briefly about four books, The Power of Habit by Charles Duhigg, Atomic Habits by James Clear, Mini Habits by Stephen Geis, and Habit Stacking by S.J. Scott. Again, habits are useful. They help us deal with everyday life. Without habits, we'd have to be deciding every time, how do I brush my teeth? How do I turn on the lights? What's the process for starting my car? Again, you know, these things are very useful to have make sense of the world and make it easier for us. As I mentioned earlier, some science has said that habits comprise about 40 to 45 percent of our actions in a day. So it would seem that we want to do our best to have those habits be useful. And while we know that the thing we need to do every day may not be useful to us, in our long-term goals, we tend to keep doing them. So whether it's eating better, exercising more, being more focused on your work, taking a strategic view, thinking how to be more creative, sometimes these just aren't part of our habits, and therefore they get lost in the pressure of everyday work. But habits truly can determine the arc of our lives, and that can be for better or worse. The behaviors that you consistently exhibit really do determine where you go in life. And that's a quote from James Clear. So a couple items just to get started on what a habit is from The Power of Habit by Charles Duhigg. He says a habit has three pieces. There's a cue, kind of what starts it, what triggers it, a response, what you do in response to that trigger, and then a reward. And then all that kind of rolls up into something they call cravings. Now, in terms of his particular habit he uses in his book, it's every afternoon he'd eat a chocolate chip cookie. The cue was mid-afternoon, he got a little bit hungry. His response was to go up to the cafeteria, buy a chocolate chip cookie, and his reward was he got to have the cookie, but he also got to talk with some friends and colleagues. And again, Charles Duhigg would say habits are very useful filters. You know, we tend to have literally thousands of stimuli every day coming in through our senses. We really depend on habits for most of our responses. And again, a habit is basically something that happens without thinking in most cases. But sometimes our existing habits are no longer helping us. And again, while this is focused on the personal, organizations have habits also. It's the how things are done around here. And that may be in written procedures, but it may just be in habits or often sometimes it might be called culture. And really in organizations where we have problems with organizational changes, it tends to bump into what are actually organizational habits. So another thing to be noted that habits can't really be erased. You don't get rid of bad habits or old habits. They are literally wired into our brains, but they can be replaced or overlaid by new habits. So the focus really has to be on not doing something, but the focus has to be on what I'm going to do next in the future. Now, we can try to use willpower, but habits are strong and willpower tends to fade over time. So even with the best of intentions, by the time we get tired in the afternoon, we may forget and just not follow our new habit. The other thing about bad habits or old habits is that there's a reward involved. And those rewards can be complicated for a person. In terms of Charles Duhigg, what he said was it was not only about the the sugar, the cookie, the taste, the chocolate chips, but it was also about talking with colleagues. 
So often you're getting some satisfaction or, quote, reward from a variety of things. Again, that makes it hard to say, oh, I'm just not going to eat cookies. Well, that wasn't really the whole reward to begin with. And again, especially when you're establishing new habits, relapses can easily happen. So we have to move ahead and yet have some forgiveness for ourselves. Now we move on to some a couple of key ideas from Atomic Habits. And here again, James Clare really says, forget about setting goals. We have all set goals and then had very little happen on them, especially over time. You know, the, the New Year's resolutions that by the second week in January, you can't even remember what they were. He says, really focus on systems or habits. Another, he uses another word, uh, systems or, or routines. And he suggests to focus on what you want to become, not what you want to achieve. And then focus on the systems you need to create and not just try to create goals around it. So the key question is, what are the new systems or habits that you need to create to be what you hope to achieve? So in his book, he talks about the laws of habit change. How can I make it obvious, make it impossible to forget? I once had a client that wanted to have a better habit for exercise. So literally, they sat their running shoes right where they would trip over them every morning. So they had to at least move them, if not put them on. How can I make it attractive? What will make me want to do it? Is there something that I need to, again, trigger an attraction and not trigger an avoidance? How can I make it easy? And we'll get to that later with many habits, but it's how can I do it so it's almost easier to do it than not do it? And then how can I make it satisfying? What reward will I experience? As we said before, old habits have rewards and they're very ingrained. So what would you view as the reward for the new habit? So moving on to our third book, talking about, you know, we talked about making it easy, attractive. This is with mini habits. And here Stephen Geis says in his summary of it, a mini habit is a very small positive behavior that you force yourself to do every day. Small steps work every time and habits are built by consistency so that the two were meant to go together. In his way of thinking, you want to make your habit too small to fail. While your big goal may be to do 50 push-ups every day, you start with a goal of one push-up per day. And that's kind of what he mentions in his book. He started with one push-up a day. He started with, I'm going to floss one tooth a day. He started with these kinds of things that are ridiculously easy, too small to even you know not do them. And once you've done one push-up, you may be inspired to do a couple of more. But your goal remains to do at least one. And since getting started is the hardest part, you may have to figure out how to do it. And again, like the example of the running shoes, you have to make it harder not to do it than to do it. So again, have it so you literally stumble over it. Or if your habit is to write the first thing in the morning, before you go to bed at night, you've got the notebook and the pencil or a pen right in front of you on the desk in the morning. Or if your habit is to not eat cookies, obviously one good way to do it is not have it any in the house. So you have to make a special trip to go do that. As I mentioned earlier, we'll all run out of willpower during the day and over time. And Stephen Geist says, when he feels resistance to a task, I tend to make it even smaller. The other thing he makes of note, and which is I've heard in many different settings, is Jerry Seinfeld's system of writing jokes. He had a big calendar on his wall, and he committed to writing one joke every day. And then he put a big X on this big calendar. And pretty soon what his reward was or what his motivation was, he didn't want to break the chain. He had all these X's on this calendar for writing one joke in a day. He wanted to keep that series going. So again, this is the idea. I'm going to do one push-up every day, one push-up every day. I don't want to break the chain. The final book we'll talk about, again, is another just kind of adds on to this whole thing here, and it's called Habit Stacking by S.J. Scott. And then he gives 120 samples of small habits that you can tack onto something else you already have as a habit. So you can make things into a routine or a sequence, and you don't have to remember each one. You probably have a getting up routine and a going to bed routine. So again, what could you do as you're doing that normal habit of getting up in the morning and going to bed? What I did is I wanted to write more. So I just said, as soon as I get up in the morning, I'm going to meditate. And then I'm going to come downstairs and I'm going to write three pages. And I have that book out. So that's the first thing I see every morning. And it's something I do before I do anything else. Now, that was actually not a mini habit. That takes about 30 minutes for me to do that. But it was something that got started and now has become fairly routine, although I have relapses. 
S.J. Scott also says, you, you know, can only remember to do about seven things at a time. And even Stephen Covey said that you could only have seven big projects. And I've heard the same thing about waiters. They can only remember about seven orders at a time. So the idea here is to tack your little mini habits onto something you're already doing so you don't have to consciously think. It's already part of the routine. The other thing is, in general, going back to how our brain works, our brain wants to use the least energy possible. And having a defined sequence helps to conserve energy and willpower. It goes back to the whole thing. Why do we have habits to begin with? One, to make sense of the world. But two, we only have so much energy and willpower. And if we use all our energy making too many decisions, we run out by the end of the day. So again, just stepping back, what are some examples of habit stacking? After waking up, I will think of three things I'm grateful for. And then I'll put in my contact lenses for the morning. Or after I put in my contact lenses, I will meditate for one minute. And then after I meditate for one minute, I will write down my three key tasks for today. Okay, this is an example of building up a small but useful routine that you might use. So with that, I would just suggest you try this out this week. Try out some small habit you could do, tack it onto something you're already doing, and see how it works. See what it is rather than focusing on your big goals or the small things. And again, you could say, what are the habits I need to become something? What are the habits I need to become a better leader? What are the habits I need to have a more effective process in my manufacturing facility? So those are the kinds of things that be thinking about. And then what's the smallest step I can take first? So again, thanks for sharing this episode with us. We hope you go ahead and really tackle this idea of habits. This was the second part of our series on key leadership skills. So on next one, rather than the habits, the things we do without thinking, we're going to shift into a different format and talk about focused work or deep work. In other words, how do you get the stuff done that really does require your full energy, where you need to avoid distractions and really stay focused? So that will be our episode next week. So thanks for listening. And again, in the show notes will be links to the four books I mentioned today. And there'll be other show notes that help kind of map this stuff out. So thanks. And we'll talk to you next time.